Hello, church. Great to be with you again as we continue our series, Equipping the Church to Evangelize in this ever-changing 21st century. I'm so glad you're uh, continuing with us as we are trying to learn on how to lead our friends, our families, our neighbors, our co-workers to Jesus, all for his glory. All right, well, let's continue. Just a little review here. We've already went through chapter one, Reaching the Lost. And we that was to motivate us as we use this workbook that I put together, Saving Souls in the 21st Century. And that's what this, this class is based on if you're just jumping in. Uh, that was to motivate us to go out and reach people for Jesus. Now, once we're motivated and we go out and start making contacts and we start making friendships with people, then the next question we're going to ask is, well, where do we take them? Chapter 2 of the workbook, Leading Someone to Christ. Now in this study, uh, in, in this series uh, of, of lessons, there are six in this chapter. And the first place that we took the student, and we've already went through this, is the sin problem. Showing them that they have a problem and sin separates them from God. And they've all sinned. And that's a bad place to be. So in a sense, we took them down. Then we brought them back up in their next couple of next study, and we showed them the solution to the sin problem. That's a grace faith system. That if grace isn't in place and faith is not in place, salvation cannot take place. And we went through that study. Then we slowed evangelism down a little bit, and we went through the covenant relationship, showing the student that who is this God that we serve? He is a covenant God. And when we enter into covenant relationship with him, it is a binding agreement. And if we don't keep it, in a sense, we'll pay with our blood. And this will help this, Christ, this, this person who is, who is getting close to becoming a Christian to be more committed as they enter into Christianity. And then we looked at the old and new covenants, having a basic understanding of how the Bible works. And this will give that student a much better a better foundation as they come into Christ and how does the whole package come together and we went through that study today we're going to talk about making disciples becoming a committed follower of Christ so let's go over to page 45 of our workbooks if you have that making disciples and hang on to this word first first now let me ask you a question. Are you tired of, of seeing this? Of seeing people do this with God? Are you, are you tired of, of watching people walk away from Jesus? And I'm telling you, I am. And I think this study is going to help us. And it's going to bring those numbers up much, much farther down of people leaving Jesus if we will practice this study when studying with people. It's not a cure-all, but I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more effective in keeping people committed to Jesus. So, I want to try to expand your thinking today. All right? So, we're going to go over here to God's commission to Christians, and specifically Matthew 28. So, let's look at Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus, this is Jesus talking to his apostles just before they leave, you know, just before he leaves this earth. And this is what he tells them. He's giving, he's telling them, look, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, because of I, I have all this authority. Here's my commission to you. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's what I want you to do, he says. And then baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So there's God's commission to Christians. This is what I want you to do. Now, as I travel all over the, well, now the world, doing these evangelism workshops, this is what I find people telling me. James, this is what we've been taught. that you. This is how you make a disciple. You baptize them and you teach them. That's how you make a disciple. Now, you can take this in the Greek, in the Greek language. That was what the New Testament was written in. And you can break that sentence down and you can come up with, yes, that is a correct way of looking at it. 
But sometimes a Greek can do this also. There can be two ways of breaking that down. And this is another correct way of breaking the verse down that actually it's going through three steps. And the first step is you make a disciple. You make a disciple first. Now, what is the definition of a disciple? Basically, it's a follower. So you make a, a person a disciple first, a follower first. Once they are committed to following Jesus, then you take that person and you baptize them in, right? Baptize them. Who's the them? The disciples. You baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word in here in the, in the Greek is E-I-S. It means into the possession of or the point reached. So that disciple is not in Jesus until they're baptized. Now they're baptized. They enter into the family of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then once they come up out of that water, you teach them and teach them and teach them and teach them. And then that person is going to go. And they're going to make a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And then they're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then teach them and teach them and teach them. And then they're going to go out and, and do the same. And it's going to go around and around and around and fill this earth. That is another correct way of looking at these verses in the Greek. Now, people say, wait a minute, James. How in the world can a person be a disciple? without being a Christian first? Well, that's a good question. A lot of people have that in their mind. If you're a disciple, you gotta be a Christian. But are you sure? Let me give you a biblical example. We're gonna look over here at the Apostle Paul, and he is gonna arrive over here at Ephesus, and he's gonna run into some guys, 12 of them actually, if you read the whole text here. And it says, uh, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found who? Some disciples. What do you call them? Disciples. So when he first runs into these guys, he runs into them and he says, you guys, I can tell you're disciples. Now, you can be a disciple of all kinds of people and all kinds of things, okay? So, so far, it hasn't really told us who these people are disciples of. So then verse 2 says, And he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? When they what? When they believed. So he's able to tell that these people are believers. Now, who do you think they're believers in? Well, they're believers in Jesus. So these people are called by, by Apostle Paul, what? Disciples. And they're called believers. And all of that happened before something very significant. They answered, no, we have not even heard there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? Paul said, John's baptism. Oh, this is John the Baptist, right? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he told the people to what? To believe in who? In the one coming after him. Who is that? That is Jesus. So John was telling people to believe in Jesus. These people are believers in Jesus. And they're disciples of who? Jesus. And Paul can tell that. And all that happened before what? Before verse 5. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. That means that prior to them being a Christian, prior to them entering into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, into their possession, they were called a disciple. They were called believers. Can you believe in Jesus? Can you be a follower of Jesus prior to being baptized? Apparently you can, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. And that's my point. We need to make sure that people are disciples before they're baptized. And guys, I got to tell you this. I think that's our problem. We are putting people in the watery grave of baptism and they are not a follower of Jesus. They are not a disciple of Jesus. And no wonder they left the next week. Because they're not following him. 
And so if we spent more time in, in, in prior to leading them to Christ and spent more time saying, hey, look, we need to be a committed follower of Jesus, that might fix a lot of this problem and we might hang on to a whole lot more people. That's the point of this study. So let's get into it. All right, so what is a disciple? Uh, it's Thus a disciple is one who follows one's teachings, okay? A follower, right? Okay, so I think this is a very important place to take people. Making a commitment, a lifelong commitment, and that's what people need to understand. So watch what Jesus says over here. Now great crowds accompanied him in Luke chapter 14 here, verse 25, and he turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not, watch this word, hate his own father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot, what? He cannot be my disciple. Now, wow, that's a strong word. We're supposed to hate? Isn't this the same Jesus that told us to love our fathers and mothers and honor them and our wives and our children, our brothers and sisters? Yes, he did. So why is he using this word? Why is he being so strong here? Because he's showing that nobody can come before him. And you can see that if you go over here to Matthew chapter 10, you're going to see Jesus word this a little bit differently. Let me read this to you over here in Matthew chapter 10. It's the same story, but it's just worded just a little bit differently. Matthew's account says, Anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus is saying, look, you can't love anybody more than me. Not even yourself. And then he says in verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple cannot you know people they wear crosses around their necks today that would never have happened in the first century i mean they were just so hideous to look at it represented death and sacrifice right that'd be like us wearing an electric chair around our neck today and that's the point if you're going to follow jesus if you're going to be his disciple right you've got to sacrifice yourself god's got to come first Jesus has to come first. Do you remember this story? Uh, being a grandfather and with grandkids. Uh, the movie Hook with Peter Pan. Do you remember that story where Peter Pan, you know, he goes back to try to save his kids. Uh, Hook took them back to Neverland. And uh, he used to be Peter Pan. And now he had grown up and forgot all about all of that. And he goes back. Well, when he goes back, he finds something out. He finds out that the kids have been following Rufio since Peter Pan's been gone. So there's Rufio on one side, and there's Pan on the other. So they take the sword, and they draw a line in the, in the sand. And he's saying, who are you going to follow? And the kids, if you remember the story, they ran back and forth. One minute they were going to follow Rufio, one minute Pan, back and forth, back and forth. And they follow, finally decided, hey, we need to follow Pan. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here in Luke chapter uh, 14. He's drawing a line in the sand. He's saying, look, you decide. Are you going to come on this side or are you going to stay on that side? And if you're going to come on this side, you must put me first above everybody. Your friends, your family, and even yourself. Uh, when I went to Poland a couple of years ago, uh, Polish, uh, there in Poland, they're 97.5% Catholic. And I was studying with two people. They were both Christians. They were younger. They both were married. One had, a, uh, had kids. The other one did not. One was newly married. But because they left the Catholic Church, because of that, uh, they uh, they would tell stories of how they would literally have a funeral 
for a person. And both of these spouses, both of their spouses were going to leave them because they had left the Catholic Church and became a Christian. Now, that's pretty hard, right? I mean, they're telling me about stories of how they had a funeral for this man, right? Their family came out and said, you are dead to us because you have left the Catholic faith and you've become a Christian. Now, that's... That's a that's a strong line in the sand, right? Jesus is saying if you're gonna if you're gonna come after me, they can't come first. Man, that is hard. I'm watching their faces, their their tears just running down their faces. What do we do, James? What do we do? Is this what Jesus is talking about? It is. It is. So he tells two stories after this. Which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and yet was not able to finish. All right? So you're going to sit down and you're going to build a house, right? Here you are, and up in Michigan, where I'm from, there's lots of basements, right? So you dig this basement, right? You get your money together. I actually had a friend that did this. One of my friends that I, was, that I grew up with in high school, he had a bunch of brothers and one sister. They had a beautiful log cabin. They had a beautiful fireplace, and it threw a spark one day, got onto the uh, big rug that they had there, burnt the house to the ground. Everybody was fine. Nobody died. Everybody was safe. But the parents went to him and said, you know what? We're tired of these northern Michigan winters where the snow's up to your, your neck. Uh, we're going to Florida. And they gave the oldest son the plot of land and said, you know what? You can do whatever you want to. So he got his money together and he built a basement. And he ran out of money. <laughs> Uh, and the rains came in and the sands, you know, uh, dirt and all that. And Walmart bags are blowing in there. And people would drive by and they would just laugh and go, man, you didn't think this out very well, did you? Uh, and that's what Jesus is saying. If you're going to come on this side, if you're going to follow me, you got to count the cost and you got to be committed to the end. That's what he's saying. And then he gives another story. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and, and deliberate uh, whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while he's yet another uh, a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all, all, all that he has, cannot be my disciple wow <laughs> you remember this guy Saddam Hussein right he made some decisions right he thought himself you know what I'm gonna go down to Kuwait this little country down here they got all this money and all this oil and I'm gonna take it from them I'm gonna take the whole country it's just a little country huh. <laughs> there's only one problem he didn't think things out very well he didn't realize that, that, that all these countries was going to come to their aid. India, Egypt, Israel, France, Britain, the United States, Saudi Arabia. All these nations and many others came to the aid of Kuwait. And would you like to see what his army looked like after they had to retreat out of Kuwait? This is what it looked like. <laughs> totally demolished. Somebody didn't think this out very well. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. We've got to make sure that we count the cost and we are in this for the long haul. He's drawing a line in the sand. He says, is this going to be about you? Or is this going to be about me? You decide. And I think that's where we need to take a person first. Now, so when we follow Jesus... Watch what he tells the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. They're going through great persecution. Things are tough, right? He says, 
he says to one church, he says, do not fear what I'm about to, about, about what you're about to suffer, but behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have what tribulation, but be faithful. How long? How long? Unto death. And I'll give you the crown of life. He says to another church, uh, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until how long? The end, I'll give authority over the nations. How long? To the end. And then he tells another church, he says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have. Hang on to it so that no one will seize your crown. Here's the deal. There is no retirement as a Christian. Right? We must be faithful unto death. This is for the long haul. This is not something you do for a week or a couple weeks and get your under, your students to understand that. Now, if we can't give better reasons to follow Jesus than the things of this world, then no one would ever follow Jesus. And this is where we really need to drive this lesson home. We need to give good reasons. Why would you follow Jesus? What can he give you that this world cannot give you? I think that's important as we're leading somebody to Jesus. So, why should I follow Jesus? That's a good question. Uh, I used to follow uh, my mom. Okay, this is not a real picture of us, but uh, here's 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 a mother and a child, right? She puts out her hand and that child hangs on and follows. Why? Because she gives him love, security, food. There's reasons why this child follows his mother. As we got older, right? There's the grandkids. Grandkids followed our grandparents. Why? Again, for the same reasons. They gave us reasons to follow them. They gave us security and love and kindness. And then as we continued to get older, who did we follow? We followed our friends, right? They gave us reasons. They were there for us. They were committed to us. We hang, hung out all the time and we followed our friends. These are the things I used to follow. And then as I got older, and if you know my story, as I, you know, left the church and played the prodigal son for uh, 14 or so years, my friends would come by with two cases of beer, and I would what? I would follow, hey man, let's go to a party. They were giving me a reason, not good reasons, and I would follow. Money. Followed after that too, right? Give me good reasons. This is security. This will, this will help you in life. Follow after money. Also follow these guys, right? Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley had all their albums. I just thought, man, they were the greatest. They were great to follow. These are the things I used to follow. Now, again, we can't give better reasons to follow Jesus and the things of this world then no one would ever follow Jesus. So let's talk about what can Jesus give more than the things that I just showed on this, on this PowerPoint. Well, here's nine reasons why I follow Jesus. Let's go to number one. Creation. Who was it that created me? Oh, that's easy, James. It was your parents. Wait a minute. Who created my parents? Who was at creation? Jesus was that creation, right? He created me. We've learned this, right? He created us. We learned this over here in Colossians. It says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, thrown, whether thrones or dominions, dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning the firstborn of the dead uh, that all things he may have preeminence all things 
That is somebody I'll follow. He created me. I follow Jesus. Gene Simmons didn't create me, did he? Mm -mm. Jesus also died for you, right? We learned this in an earlier study that Jesus is our propitiation. That only Jesus can satisfy God's wrath for our, for our sins. And how did he satisfy God's wrath against our sins? By taking that perfect spotless lamb and dying for us. Right? When you live in northern Michigan, uh, there is a lake where I preached at. It's, uh, in the town of Beulah, it's called Crystal Lake. Nine miles long, two and a half miles wide, beautiful lake. This would happen almost every year. When winter starts coming, the lake starts to freeze over, okay? And when it just starts to freeze over, it hasn't froze over totally yet. It freezes on the edges. You know what happens? These guys get out here and they start running their snowmobiles and they ride on the edge. Usually alcohol is involved, unfortunately, and they don't wait until it's froze over and they fall down and that snowmobile goes straight down into the water. Well, every once in a while, somebody will be with them and pull them out of that water and save their life. And sure enough, you'll see them on the news that night up at the Munson Hospital over in Traverse City. And they'll have the camera crews there. And this guy will be laying in bed and he'll have his arm around this guy. It saved his life. And he'll say, man, this is going to be my best friend. He saved my life. Man, we're going to go out to dinner because he saved me. When we get our students to understand that there is nobody, nobody that can die for us except for Jesus. God would never accept me dying for you. I couldn't die for my kids and say, God, take my life and sacrifice for my kids. He wouldn't accept me because I'm contaminated with sin. He wouldn't accept you dying for me and me dying for you. There's only one. And who is that? That is Jesus. He died in our place. Now, folks, that's somebody. How far? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. And then, how much does he love me? How much does Jesus love me? Jesus loves us. I've had a lot of people in this world love me. I've had a lot of people show wonderful love towards me. But do you know that none of them have loved me like Jesus? It doesn't make sense what Jesus has done for me. I look at my life and I look at all of the wrong that I've done towards him and his father. And it doesn't make sense that he would die for me. He should have just annihilated me. Jesus hangs on that cross. And who do we see at that cross? Well, we see some people gambling for his clothes. He's literally, Jesus is hanging there naked. And that is so humiliating. As people walk by on this road, everybody can see him. It's a Passover. There's, there could be as many as two million people in town all watching Jesus being humiliated. While that is going on, you've got these Pharisees, these religious people, and they're just in, hurling insults at him. Uh, like nobody's business. Oh, if you could just save yourself, right? Uh, if you saved Lazarus, you raised him from the dead, but you can't save yourself. Just one accusation after another, right? And then who else do you find? Well, who do you not find? His apostles, his best friends. What'd they do? They abandoned him. They all ran away. And his one time of, of need where are they? They're, they're scared. They're afraid. That's going to happen to them. And they all abandoned them. The only one that came back that we have record of coming back is the Apostle John. Isn't that sad? And then there's a Roman centurion there that's going to take a spear and shove it up into Jesus' side. Making sure that he's dead after he's died. 
He knows that. That's who's at the bottom of the cross. Now, what does Jesus say to those people? He says, what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is a love that that is way beyond me. That is a love I do not understand. But I'm so thankful for it. He loves me so much. And because of that, I'll follow him. Get your students to understand that. He supplies our needs, right? He gives us all that we need, Jesus. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I want you to know that all the people that have shown me great love in this world, my mom, my dad, uh, sister, uh, friends, other family members, church members, uh, a wife, uh, my kids. Do you know what? Every one of them have failed me. And I have failed every one of them. But what does Jesus say? I'll never fail you. I'll never forsake you. Guys, I walked away from Jesus for 14 years. But he didn't leave me. He was still there. Still giving me breath in my mouth. Still giving me a chance to come back. That's somebody I'll follow. And then Jesus is holy. Aren't you so tired of seeing how sinful this world is? I was going up 45 the other day and it's like a, I was telling Steve, it's like a, like a race car, uh, you know, uh, speedway or whatever out there. I mean, it's just like these cars are just in and out and they're going 90, 100 miles an hour going up and down this highway. I am so tired of seeing the sin of this world. And, and, and people just don't care anymore. And you know what? I've, I've contributed enough of my sin to this world also. But I'm tired of it. It sickens me. But when I look at Jesus, he has none of that. He is holy. You know how refreshing that is? To just want to run to him because he is holy. He is sinless. He has nothing to do with that. That's what I want in my life. That's what I want to be surrounded th with. Do you think Paul Stanley or Gene Simmons or that guy that's bringing two cases of beer, can they give me those things? Can they die in my place, right? Are they going to supply my needs? No. So who am I going to follow? I'm going to follow Jesus. And then Revelation says that Jesus holds the keys of death in Hades. So I'm standing there, up in Kalkaska, Michigan. My dad had died. I remember standing there at the funeral. And all the best people of my world are standing there with me. Uh, I, I got my sister there. I've got my friends from high school. I've got my church family, the, the, the best and closest people to my life are right there. And they're dropping my dad down into this hole. And I'm looking for somebody to help. Who can get him out? Nobody. Nobody can help. <laughs> but Jesus says, I've got the keys. I've got the keys to death in Hades. And he says that because I, I rose from the grave, every single one of those people are coming up out of the grave. Now, man, I'm telling you, that's somebody I'll follow. He can give me things that nobody can give to me on this earth. Amen? Amen. And Jesus is also God. He is God. We see this over in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is a prophecy about 700 years before Jesus ever came to this earth. It says, for us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor. That's another word for the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14. He's also going to be called Mighty God. 
He's also going to be called Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This only fits one person. A child. He was a son. He will rule. Holy Spirit. He's God. He's the Father. He's Jesus. He's God. I will follow somebody like that. And then last of all, what does Jesus say? Have you ever wondered what Judgment Day is going to look like? Come over here to John chapter 12, and Jesus gives us a pretty good picture of what Judgment Day is going to look like. Let me read it for you. It's in verse 47. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I don't judge him. This is what Jesus says. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him on the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father sent me, commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his commands leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father told me to say. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. I come to save it. But there is going to be one who's going to judge you, and he's going to judge you by what? by my very words I'm not going to be judged by my friends on judgment day This I'm not going to be judged by my mom or my grandmother or my Sunday school teacher I'm going to be judged by these very words that is a person I follow and who are these words every single word in this Bible are Jesus words and they came straight from the Father I'll follow somebody like that. So, here's the question. Are you ready to follow? Get your student to answer this question. Are you ready to follow? Are you ready to be a disciple and follow Jesus? If so, then you have taken the first step towards salvation. Remember, you're not in Christ yet. You haven't been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Making the decision to follow is just the first step. Continue to read the next study and find out from God's word how you can become a saved covenant child of God. I mean, it may happen just one minute before a person is baptized. But folks, we've got to make sure that they are committed and following Jesus. And I think if we give them better reasons on why to follow Jesus, we will not lose as many people and we will be more correctly following the great commission verses that god has given us i pray this study has helped you i know it's kind of stretched your mind i got a little emotional there i always do in these studies but uh we've got to give better reasons to follow jesus hope to see you next time god bless you if you got any questions or like to call me uh, just holler at me or send me an email and uh We'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about these, these things next. God bless you.